Right, I'm David Ginsberg, uh, which you already know, I guess, because I was introduced by Michael. So let me quickly do the following. I'm going to introduce our, our guests. I'm going to quickly set the stage for uh, the show. Uh, and then I'm going to ask a few questions, and I promise in advance there'll be plenty of time for you to ask your questions, because actually y your questions are more important than my questions, and I really mean that. Peter Gould is a writer, director, and producer. He worked on all five seasons of the uh, AMC drama Breaking Bad. He was nominated for four Writers Guild of America awards for his work on the series. He is currently a uh, co-showrunner and co-writer with Vince Gilligan. We, we, we won a bunch, too. Didn't just nominate it. So just, I did some nice. big, big uh, <laughs> Right, just to get it accurate, right? Right. You're saying that for your whole staff. That's it's right. Lovely. Interestingly, this came from your bio. Oh, oops. Well, we have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Mine just says I went to Stanford. Okay. There you go. We, here we are. <laughs> okay, so you're a uh, co-showrunner and co-writer with Vince Gilligan on the spin-off series Better Call Saul that we visit today. Mm -hmm. The show debuted in February 2015 and was the highest rated cable television uh, series premiere to that date. Maybe still to date. I don't know. I, that seems like... Very well could some, be. Let's say that. Let's say that. Yes. Yep. Okay. We'll go yep. with that. He was graduated from Sarah Lawrence College with a Bachelor of Arts uh, degree in English and from the University of Southern California with a Master of Fine Arts. Ray Seahorn plays Kim Wexler in Better Call Saul. She is known for prior ro uh, roles in NBC's Whitney, ABC's I'm With Her, and TNT's Franklin and Bash, among many other shows. She was born in Norfolk, Virginia, though she also grew up in Japan, Arizona, and Washington, D.C. She studied painting, drawing, and architecture, though a passion for the performing arts led her to contemporary theater in college. She was graduated from George Mason University with a Bachelor of Arts. The show. Esquire magazine said this, and I, I've, this is sort of a summary, but I like it. For a show that is literally derivative, Better Call Saul has been startlingly original. Spinoffs are supposed to be worse than the shows that gave birth to them, but Better Call Saul has become something more, too, a show that not only follows from its predecessor, but has become a commentary on it, a companion show to the original. Both fall under the category of the study of difficult men. Presumably, there'll be some difficult women shows, but this one falls in the category of difficult men. These shows, said Esquire, have articulated to this, the same dramatic situation over and over again. What happens to men living in a world of decline? In Better Call Saul, we know the end. The frame of Better Call Saul is a prequel, an origin story, which means we know that McGill turns into Saul Goodman, the pure scumbag lawyer. We also know that he turns into the terrified manager of a Cinnabon who drinks. We are, it's the manager who drinks, not the Cinnabon. That's the way they wrote it. We are following him on his journey to both conclusions, the outcast loser and the hyper-confident prick with no ethics. So here are some questions. Peter. We know that there are three personas to our eponymous hero, schlepper lawyer Jimmy McGill, drug dealer defense counsel Saul Goodman, and Cinnabon manager Jeannie. Here is perhaps the most obvious existential question regarding the series. Did you conceive of these as merely opportunistic adopted facets of the same guy or truly different personalities? Put another way, is Jimmy the underlying true core of the character? We know he's good at scams, which means he's good at pretending to be people that he's not. Mm -hmm. so, what an interesting question. Um, I think, boy, if I, I, I don't think I have a definitive answer because that's part of what the show is, is, is trying to find the answer to that. Is what, his, what is his true identity? He's, I think he's like a lot of us in that he's trying on different hats, trying to see which one fits. He's trying to find a place in the world. Who He's trying to find an identity that works for him. And uh, he tries out a bunch of things. He also has another identity, which, which, is, which is the the guy who he was before he came to Albuquerque when he was called Slippin' Jimmy, which is when he was a uh, an out and out con artist. Uh, and so he's uh, he is he is trying on different things. But I think he, he the the great thing about this character and the way Bob plays him is he everything he does he jumps in with both feet. Uh, there's an earnestness and a forcefulness and also an optimism to the character. Uh, it, maybe not when he becomes Gene, the Cinnabon manager, but before that, it seems like he's always thinking the next, the next thing he does is going to be the one that works. Uh, so maybe that's the thing that they have, maybe that's the thing that they have in common 
and it seems like a very, there's something very uh, appealing to me about the idea of a character who's, uh, who has that optimism and that's, it, and it's a lot of you know, the comments you read from uh, Esquire, a lot of how we started the show was to think about it in opposition or in differentiation uh, to Breaking Bad. And so a lot of the things I've mentioned are, um, are in opposition to what Walter White uh, was on Breaking Bad. So, but but it's, it's an interesting question. And there may be, uh, in fact, even the last episode that we aired, he, he adopts another identity, which is uh, Saul Goodman, the uh, TV commercial pitchman. Uh, who, before he becomes a lawyer, he's trying to sell off his commercial time. So this is a guy who is, I think there's something fascinating about it. It's not something I've seen a lot of. He's somebody who, who he will change his identity to some extent, but there's also a core. There's a core that's, that stays the same, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, his feelings for the people who matter to him in his life, uh, and, and for better or for worse, that's really uh, his brother and, and, his, and his, his, the love of his life, Kim Wexler. Okay, as a follow-up, because you mentioned it, if you watch this week's episode, that which aired on Monday, we are introduced to Saul Goodman in a, a formal way, which I think is the first time in the series we've actually seen him as Saul Goodman. Though we saw in the first episode, I think, of season two, when he was caught in the trash area of Cinnabon, he left a, a, a graffito that said SG was here. So even then, he conceived of himself still as Saul Goodman. He also uses it as a con name with um, Marco in a flashback in That's Chicago. That's right, yeah. Well, so here's the question. It's been suggested, uh, and I think in this week's episode, that Saul Goodman is a rendering of something like Saul Goodman. Mm -hmm. But was the name ultimately adopted uh, for a defense litigator so that he'd appear to be Jewish with whatever that implies in law or life? <laughs> That is well. Yes, I, it's it, the very first something? the very first episode uh, uh, of Breaking Bad in which Saul appears. Uh, he says something to the effect, uh, "The real name is McGill. I just do the Jew thing for the homeboys, or something like that." <laughs> uh, so he's he's obvious. We haven't seen how that comes about, but he's he's obviously playing to a, uh, a stereotype. Uh, you know, maybe you could think of the uh, the. The lawyer from the Wire, or one of one of many other many other nefarious, uh, possibly Jewish defense attorneys who appeared in, in stories and media, and he's playing into that stereotype. Fair enough. Ray, Kim Wexler is a smart, competent corporate lawyer who started out at the big firm of Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill. In your conception, what is the core attraction of Ray that she sees in Jimmy? On that point, the New York Times wondered, read the episode we just saw. If Jimmy and Kim are still a couple as they once were, they seem to be, but not in the previous few episodes of this season. Um, so which part do you want me to answer? What do I think Kim's attraction? Yeah, what well, fundamentally, what did, because you know he has the limitations we know that we see, but Kim sees something else as well. Obviously, she's genuinely connected to him. So what, well, what is it? Some of what she sees is exactly why the audience loves why viewers love uh, not only Jimmy, but even parts of Saul. Um, uh, I love the scenes uh, earlier. I, I, I guess it's in the pilot. When, no, it's not. It's uh, when he has to argue with um, Tuco in the desert mm -hmm. about the twins, whether or not they're going to get their arms cut off or their mm -hmm. legs cut off. And, <laughs> yeah. He negotiates. <laughs> right. The, the situation is extreme and horrible, but the lawyering is brilliant. Um, and uh, I love that scene because he, he is, we do see that he is good at, at what he does and um, very intelligent, um, quite artful. And... Uh, and there's plenty of scenes that you see in season one of her appreciation for him coloring just outside of the lines with the billboard scene and um, and some other stuff. Uh, and even when they're sitting on the bed eating pie, there's this limit, this line that's just before, oh, you fabricated evidence. Okay, hang on. That's a problem. Um, so I think um, much of what she loves about him is very obvious to a lot of people, uh, I think. Um, and then beyond that, their connection, I always thought they had more alike than not alike. Well, she um, joins him in a scam, sort of, uh, I think in season two or something. Yes, it's not, it's, yes, it's 201. It's not just that. I see them both as um, outsiders that uh, know how to wear the right mask and um, literally the right suit for the job. Um, 
And he is, although he's the con man, he is the least duplicitous person in her life. Um, and his execution is way off, but his intentions are solid. And I don't think this is about a woman that needed somebody and he was there. I think there is a strong connection. Um, like I said, there's, there's some essence that actually is similar. And as far as her growth, I don't see that as all negative of he's taking her down. There are terrible repercussions of the road that they're going down and that she's going down separately. Um, I always tell people, when I think about the Mesa Verde case that she kept and the ill-gotten gains, she did protect Jimmy and that was um, a deep fissure in the relationship and their understanding of each other, but she did not recuse herself of the case. She could have not taken the paycheck, but she theoretically deserves it, which I think is what's so hard for her in this episode. To hear Jimmy saying on the tape, there's a million different things I, I, I thought that Kim would be thinking during that, um, but uh, from positive to negative, a, a wide spectrum, but one of them is that he is speaking to, I think, one of the reasons that she kept the case, which is she does deserve it. However, it's that's not legal. That has no place in the courtroom, which is what I think is part of her uh, unraveling, is that um, it would be a lot better for her if things were black and white and if good and bad was the same as legal and illegal. And it's and she's being forced to reckon with the fact that it's not and that life, life is in the gray outside of the courtroom. Um, and Jimmy is exploring that as well. So I don't think it is as foreign to her as it might seem. Quick question follow-up. Can you share anything in your personal or professional past, that is your life or the characters you've played, that inform and show up in Kim's? Um, <laughs> um, well, I can speak to the things that are different. She would win at poker and I would lose. Um, there is uh, <laughs> one of my biggest challenges that I adore in the role is she's incredibly still and she gives up very little and that's not me in real life and the choice the choice also to not need to fill silences is something I struggle with in in real life to check the comfort level in the room and to want to make sure people are okay and not about to hang themselves and um, socially and uh, to want to to want to make things right or to overly explain yourself is, um, is a horrible habit of my own. And so it's been a great pleasure to play someone who measures everything very carefully and, uh, and um, uses not speaking as a position of power. Um, I don't see her as weak in any way when she chooses to not participate in a conversation um, or chooses to not give up anything gesturally or facially. Um, something I do share with her is, uh, is a clocking of, I just go about it in a different way. But I, under, I understand, I was going to say, the clocking of who you do let in and, and letting that be measured. Mine, my, I go about mine a different way. That and burying yourself in your work uh, being something that saves you but can ultimately condemn you if you don't watch it. <laughs> Agreed. I think most <laughs> practitioners would agree with that, too. You're a really hard worker. I mean, that's that's something you you, you share with. That's Jim. what I said. Like, yes, yeah, and it, it can be your it can be your best quality, and it can be your undoing if you don't watch it. And I I 100% understand that in her. Peter, you and Vince create television together with obviously admirable results. Can you describe your working methods uh, and how, if at all, your focus of contribution to the finished work differ? You know, I don't. That's that's a what a. That's he has an accent. I, yeah, he has an accent. He, he's from <laughs> he's from he's from Virginia, and and so he's got a Virginia accent. I have the nasal New York thing going on. Um, you know, it's it's a that's a it's I I have to say I haven't pulled it apart uh, that much. It, of course, on Breaking Bad, Vince hired me. You know, he was he was my he was my boss on Breaking Bad. He was the the creator and the showrunner of Breaking Bad, and I was. Uh, just damn lucky to be there and, and, uh, and, and get to, uh, fortunately, uh, he, he valued uh, w w what I was able to bring to the table, so I was able to, to stay and, and climb the ladder. And then, you know, it, where there was a shift, uh, you know, so, uh, it seemed like there would be a shift when we're working together uh, as equals on, uh, on Better Call Saul, but in a lot of ways, 
the way Vince works, and actually the way I work too with other writers, is it's, it, I don't want to say, democratic is a funny word, it, but it, it's uh, having uh, a power relationship isn't necessarily the, the most useful thing. The best thing is when people are working together and your focus is not on you know the ladder of who's the ladder of of of, 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 uh, of authority, but you're just focusing on the project and the scene and what works and what who the who the characters are. So I have to say I think the um, I think we evolved a method uh, from working on uh, Breaking Bad, and some of it was derived from um, Vince's work on X Files. So there's there's a method. There's a method that was used on X Files, which goes way back in television, where we use a lot of uh, there's a lot of three by five cards, and there's a lot of uh, hand done calligraphy on the three by five cards. Uh, that's that method has really stayed the same. And this season, this season uh, was really different for me because as the season went on, uh, Vince stepped back uh, from the show, so I was running it by myself, and that was it was. Uh, a lot of fun, but very stressful, and I'd love to. I'd love to have him back when he's when he when he wants to come back. But we're having, I, I think I think the season came out great. So um, it's awesome. The whole rest of the yeah, season is great. I don't know when and we yeah. they're in they're in Albuquerque, and then as a showrunner or, or Peter writing show show running it and then directing, and he's a great director. But you then have to fly to New Mexico to do that while yeah. your writer's room is still in Albuquerque trying to complete the rest of the episodes. They're not, you don't complete all 10 and then go shoot them. Of course that's right. Do. That would be a different, that's a different, there, is a, there are shows that do that. We, we do it differently. He uh, didn't but, have white hair before no, I, you know, this, <laughs> this season. No, this, is, this is absolutely true. Uh, although I usually blame my daughter uh, for, the, for that. Uh, so I, but, you know, the, the, thing, the thing about it is, it's really, it's the, I don't want to say the best idea wins, but it's just it's it's something where Vince and I never really have an argument. It's it's we'll, one of us will say, yeah, you know, I like that, but what about this and what about that? And then it just emerges that there's something that we can both get behind, uh, or the whole writers room really get, can get behind and, and are excited about. And that's that's part of when working with a group of people as opposed to going by yourself. It's a little bit. Like um, it's like a, like wearing a jetpack because everything <laughs> moves faster. Uh, you know the speed of thought is faster, and also there's a uh, there's an outgoing social aspect, which is that you're we spend a lot of time around a table pitching, which might and to the outsider it might seem like the most boring thing in the world. It's a bunch of people. It looks like it probably for the out to the outside it looks like a sequestered jury because we're all sitting around and but but. When you're in it, or at least for me, when I'm in it, it's like you're watching the show and you're watching the characters do different things. And then you say, "Well, that, but why is she doing that? What what is Kim thinking there? Why would she do this particular thing?" And a lot of what we evolved on uh, on Breaking Bad was not to think. I know this is a funny way to put it, not to think ahead about what's going to happen next but to, to look more at what has already happened and try to understand why the characters have done what they've done. And that's the most difficult thing. It's the most difficult thing is to try to understand the characters. And that's something that, that Vince and I, this is something that, that we, we share and we struggle with. Uh, and, but the great thing about, uh, and I'm just blathering on, but I'm gonna keep going. Uh, the great thing about television doing a serialized show like this is that we get to learn about the characters from the actors' performances. So Ray, you know, if you, if you watch the very first episode of Better Call Saul, Ray's character is introduced with, I think, like, like five words. You, the, two of you are, the two of you are leaning against a... Um, it's one sentence split in it's half. It's one sentence split I think he split has three half. words and I have three. I, okay, so we split yeah, three and three. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, the character is very mysterious and we had thoughts about who she was, but then seeing Ray, uh, seeing Ray actually perform the character, she's just cool. She's just cool. And when she's with Jimmy, what I realized watching Ray is that J J Kim is not there because she needs Jimmy. She's there because she likes Jimmy. She's in the relationship because she wants to be. I think in the Jimmy, on the other hand, sometimes seems like he needs her, uh, which is a, it's and it's a it's a it doesn't mean. I don't know what it means emotionally, but it feel it feels different. It feels like she has uh, she's a little bit more 
self-contained that he is. Uh, and that's, I enjoy that as yes. far as gender stereotypes go on TV. I'm the I'm more of the male, and he's more of the female. He's oh, very emotionally he's so reactive. <laughs> he has to talk everything out. She's like, it's a project. There's a problem and a solution. Let's yeah. just keep moving forward. But that's just based on that's just that's just reality. That's the difference between learning from uh, learning from watching other TV shows and movies and learning from reality. Because when I look around, I see, I see that, I see that all the time. <laughs> Let me ask you, both, both of you, this. Can you comment on one of this season's central professional and legal conflicts? We just saw it. Kim represents Jimmy, with whom she's in a professional and romantic relationship, in a case where he is accused of falsifying documents for the purpose of helping her get Mesa Verde as a big client. So, I mean, obviously Simple. you're cognizant, it, but it's a, it's a rather complex relationship. It's visited in this episode, and so how, how'd you get there? Step by step. Uh, step by step, uh, you know, Jimmy. Jimmy is a character who cannot help but see the shortest distance between two points. He's always he can see it. He can see a shortcut, always. And he also has, I think, his own sense of morality. And when he sees that Mesa Verde uh, leaves Kim, who he knows has worked her ass off for it. Uh, leave, uh, leave, leaves her uh, really in, in, in Jimmy's mind uh, just because it's the old boys network which is kind of what it is um, and of course Chuck we see on the show does a wonderful sales job uh, and a very beautiful piece of uh, psycho psychological uh, salesmanship but from Jimmy's point of view he, his brother's really stolen something from Kim and he can't. He wants to make her happy. He doesn't particularly want. He doesn't want her to know about it. I think that the the problem for Jimmy was that Kim found out about it because it's. It, she is. I think one of the the, the highlights uh, of his life is the moment when she gets Mesa Verde back. There's this great moment where she gets this call that they're that they're coming back to her and they're going from this enormous uh, enormous law firm to. Uh, you know, a single a single solo practitioner, which you know you could wonder about um, from their point of view. But uh, that there that she's going to be going back to being the outside counsel. She is so happy. There, it's a, it's just such a moment of delight between the two of them. That's the reward for him. But he's he, as happy as she is. Absolutely, him. absolutely. Because I mean, I, I think he's he he loves her. He loves her a lot. And he, he wants, but you know, he, he's not able to restrain himself from using his abilities. And so he, um, he does this thing, and then she finds out about it, and Chuck finds out about it. Well, Chuck figures it out. He doesn't find out about it. He just, it's, it's, it's transparent to Chuck, because the alternative for Chuck is to doubt his own mind, which Chuck isn't willing to do. Chuck isn't willing to, to think that there could be anything wrong with his perception of the world. And uh, so that's that's how we got there. And then Kim, but Kim has. Do you think is, part of it though is oh, also that yeah. Jimmy doesn't? It's particularly that it's Chuck too, right? I always felt like I it isn't so. just that he doesn't want the good guys to win. Yes. It's his brother, and the I, way he gets Mesa Verde back yes. is horribly embarrassing in a very specific way. Yes. That he knows Chuck would hate. I don't know that Jimmy. Well, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, it's just it's I mean, it's all up to the viewer. Uh, yeah. But I, in my mind. Jimmy didn't, and it's, he says this more or less. It, I'm sorry, we're really getting deep in the weeds. He says, he says this, he says that, um, he says that, you know, anybody else would have said, oh, I made a mistake, shit, yeah. which is what he expects Chuck to do. But Chuck can't, he can't deal with the fact that he's, he thinks he's made a mistake. And of course, Chuck has a much bigger mistake staring right at, right in his face, which is that he thinks he's allergic to electricity. <laughs> and, and all the information he's getting from the world says, no, you're not really, the, the doctor in the hospital says, no, you need help. And he's not willing to acknowledge that. But transposing two numbers, no also way. he can't deal with. You're so. after the Magna Carta. That's right, that's right. You can't uh, forget that. Uh, that's, that's, that's right. Of course, how could you make that mistake? Um, so the, uh, but I think Kim, Kim has, a, and it's it's a key decision she makes. She could she re, could rec, just like Ray says she could recuse herself, but Jimmy has done he's he's corrupted her. He's given her something that from her point of view he's given her something that she can't resist. She can't resist. She can, she's earned it in an objective sense. She's earned it, uh, 
but legally she should she should just not take she should not take the job and you know it's those complexities that we find most interesting uh, that's where that's where the for us it's where the drama is uh, and, and I don't feel like Jimmy is corrupting him but he is causing her to make a decision which um, I don't know, lessens her opinion of herself, maybe? That might be a way. I don't yeah, know. I don't, it's, you're it's you're the expert. It's complex. Yeah, it's complex. Um, there's also the idea of like shining sunlight on, um, on the seeds that everybody has in them. You know, this is what, what's growing. Is it corrupting somebody or bringing out something that is an issue already? I yeah, don't know. It could, could be, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have many more questions, but as promised, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So I think there's a microphone out there is there some oh because there's a oh we're on camera oh, oh good so, oh, i'm turning this way from now on. <laughs> hi um well we've come to love kim as a character thank you and um the fact thank that she guy. he wrote her <laughs> the fact that she is not uh, a character in breaking bad makes me worry about what happens to her <laughs> um did you peter um decide what happens to her before you uh, started uh, shooting and casting the series, and does Ray know what happens to her? Uh, that it? would be terrible if you decided, like, based on casting. Oh, it's Ray. We should never cast. Well, you know, we always have that flexibility. Uh, the the um, uh, the answer the answer is really easy because we don't really fig. We we have I, we sometimes we have ideas about what might happen, but we never really. It's not planned in that sense. Uh, well, the way this show works and the way Breaking Bad works is that we have ideas about things that we'd like to see or we'd like to do, but we have to work um, sequentially. Because the way the characters live, they live moment to moment. And if you say, uh, you know, in such and such an episode, this character is going to do that. Well, I'll give you an example. On Breaking Bad, we had a season where we had a big board that had all the all the episodes lined up, and we said, episode seven, Skyler realizes that Walt is a drug dealer, or eight, or not, whatever it was. Um, and we realized as we started working on the season that she was too smart. She was going to figure. She, why would she? Why would it take her so long to figure this out? And so instead of trying to, because another approach would be, well, let's make her not as smart. Or let's <laughs> let's come up with lots of reasons why she's you know she's really busy. I don't know. Uh, uh, but instead, we, we we hit it head on, and that's that's really how we operate. So uh, I agree. There's we're worried about Kim we, in the writers' room. We're worried about Kim. We're worried about Chuck because these are two characters who aren't on Breaking Bad. And more uh, more significantly to me um, is the question because you could you don't really know that much about Saul Goodman on Breaking Bad. He could potentially. Uh, Bob pitched the other day that he, you know, maybe when he saw Goodman, he uh, he gets in his Cadillac at the end of the day, drives drives uh, up to Santa Fe, uh, you know, ch changes out of his crazy suit into a black Steve Jobs turtleneck, uh, <laughs> you know, puts puts on Miles Davis, uh, Miles Davis on his uh, amplifier, his tube amplifier, and then cooks uh, cooks a uh, cooks a vegetarian meal for Kim and the kids. Uh, it could funny. be. It could be. That's so it funny. It could be. It could be. I find that hard to picture. Uh, so I don't know how we get there, but uh, I, I love the idea. <laughs> That's funny. Great. Thank you. Um, so, sort of following up on what, what you just said, uh, Peter, uh, do you find your, yourself being surprised by uh, what your characters do sometimes when you're doing the writing? Uh, and, and do they take you in places you hadn't expected? I, boy, that's that's absolutely. This is my preoccupation in the writers' room: is are these characters surprising us? Are are we finding? Are they doing things uh, that we're not expecting in the writers' room? If we because sometimes we'll give a character a choice and we'll say, "Wait a minute! It seems like maybe it seems the obvious logical choice would be to do this, but what if the character did the opposite? Doesn't that feel right? Why would?" Hmm. Why would this character do this instead of that? That's that's and I, that to me is the ground uh, truth. That's what I'm most interested in. Is not and I, I would distinguish that from trying to um, trick the audience or have a, a, a twist. 
because a twist, a, pl a story twists are great, but the best twist is when the character does something that you're not expecting, or in some ways doesn't even make sense uh, logically, but is the right thing for that character psychologically in the moment. And so that's absolutely, I'm always hoping, uh, and that sometimes that's, we'll be in the middle of an episode, and one of us or all of us will say, you know, this feels like they're doing what we would expect. Uh, and maybe you know these characters are complicated enough and interesting enough that they might do something that we're not expecting. So that abs that's that's my that's that's one of my pre personally my preoccupations with the show. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm wondering um, what the demographic is of the audience for your show, and also, have you ever written things into the plot that you know your audience will hate? <laughs> uh, I you know I hate to say it. I pay no attention to that at all. The demographics, uh, I, I, the demographics or the ratings. I, I, they send, Sony and AMC send an email every week that I just promptly archive. Uh, it, you know, if, I think if you try, if we tried chasing what we thought the audience would like, then I think we'd be doing our show and ourselves a disservice. I think we we try with the. Really, we're the the way we think of it is that we're the first audience for the show, and we the, what we're hoping is that we can amuse and please ourselves, and then we're praying that the audience likes what we like. But if if we try to if you try to build a, mo a mental model of you know who who you're who you're who you're uh, who you're trying to address, uh, then I think you're kind of limiting what what you can do. And so we're in a very fortunate position because apparently. Uh, it, apparently, it's doing well enough to keep going, which is really that's really that's really that's re that's really the thing that I'm most concerned about is that hopefully that enough people are watching, and we're in a wonderful era of television where an audience that would have gotten a show canceled instantly um, 10, 10 years ago, fifteen years ago, now is enough folks uh, is now monetizable or whatever whatever the word is uh, it, uh, can can be profitable enough to keep a show going. And we're, we're very lucky about that. Uh, so I, I, I probably you could Google and find out what our demographic. Don't tell me, though. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what is the, um, what's the riskiest thing you've ever done with the writing of the show? The riskiest thing we've ever done? Uh, that's a good, you know, well, there are two of them that I can think of offhand. Um, and one of them you haven't seen yet. Because uh, there is there's some there's some things have coming up this season that, I, for all I know, people are going to be coming after us with torches. Uh, and in fact, you know, the episode that you just watched, in a weird way, that was very risky for us. We've never done a, an episode with this much dialogue in a courtroom without Mike Erman Trout, without any of the the underworld side of the show, uh, is, is, is almost completely absent. So that was a risk, but I think the, the one that I remember the best uh, is actually on Breaking Bad, uh, which was uh, Jane's death. Um, uh, if you remember, Jesse had a girlfriend who um, starts uh, aspirate. She's, they're, both, they both, uh, they're both high on heroin. And uh, Walt is in, has come in, and he watches her aspirate and die, uh, and he doesn't do anything about it. And uh, that was something that we were all scared of. And in fact, the original pitch of that scene was that Walt, while Jane was uh, high, he would, he would go and he would uh, cook up another dose of heroin and inject her and give her an overdose. And we decided that Walt wasn't ready for that, and we weren't either. Uh, but in, in fact, he, 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 he just doesn't rescue this young woman who's dying, and I think that was that was a turning point for Breaking Bad. For Better Call Saul, I, I think some of the things, uh, some of the things that are riskiest are actually coming up in this season. Thanks. I was very impressed with your persona, um, and Rhea, I wondered when you change facial expressions, like you raised your eyebrow one time, is that cued, or is that what you just naturally do? Uh, Interesting. They're not, um, 
the minutia of like facial expressions and gestures are not written into the scripts, but um, but they are um, novelistic in their reading more so than other scripts that have had. There's a lot of um, tone uh, and like narrative writing that sets that sets a mood um, <clears throat> in a way that I find. Um, inspiring instead of limiting as an actor. It doesn't feel like I've been told what to do or anything. Mm -hmm. After that, um, some of it is definitely decisions. Bob and I um, rehearse a lot because I feel, we both feel that a relationship of 10 plus years, um, almost everything is between the lines at this point. <laughs> it's, it's, you can't say anything without there being another meaning between of a history of it. Um, and so that's where some of that comes in. And then, and Bob is a very generous performer, and we enjoy quite a bit um, the scene that doesn't happen until you get to do it with your scene partner. Because you can rehearse it alone all you want to, but if your scene partner, as in like in real life, you think you know what you're going to say, but then the other person uh, looks away while you're talking to them, or delivers their line just a little bit snappy, um, or starts fidgeting, uh, and suddenly you 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 reframe what you were about to say, and it has a different intention. Other than that, I have a rubber face, and I really don't know what's going on with it at any given time. <laughs> like I said, one of my biggest challenges is stop, stop moving. <laughs> you know. That's what was so impressive. So, thank Hi. I have a related question uh, to that one. I used to be a trial lawyer in my younger days, and I really do uh, admire the way that you, the authenticity you bring t uh, to the actual hearing and the way you move around. Thank you. Uh, as a lawyer, did you go watch lawyers, women lawyers? Some, but you know what I tried to watch was, um, uh, what's it called, um, when you can watch actual like um, civic trials and stuff on cable access channels because we had a great talk about what level of performance are these characters uh, because unlike some beautifully done law shows where the actor is has their own flirt, you know, they are really great actors. Um, and these aren't. And they're also, there's no jury here. So it isn't even supposed to be performance level in the episode that you saw. Um, so uh, it is more restrained. And, you know, you had to investigate um, just because this is something that she aspires to and is very good at the paperwork, uh, how socially comfortable is she speaking in front of people. and and all the different things that were going on. So I tried to watch real people doing it. <laughs> um, and while it was very good, it wasn't heightened performance. It wasn't um, a grand monologue. Um, it wasn't turning to the audience dramatically and you know making sure they heard me and this kind of stuff. Um, Mention Scott, the, the, the interest in Scott Turow. Oh, yeah. I, um, we do have we do have law consultants. There are law consultants that help write it, in, in, and then there's law consultants down there. Both Gordon's sister, but also Melissa Bernstein knows a practicing Albuquerque lawyer who's a woman. I talk to her a lot and ask questions. Um, but Dave's talking about when we first started. I knew it wasn't going to be a procedural in general, and I certainly couldn't quickly study the law in general <laughs> before I went down to shoot. Um, so I've tried to start from a place of how does the law affect uh, the person studying it, let alone the person practicing it. And um, my manager who went to law school suggested Scott Turow's book 1L, 1972 book, which I still take down and it is now dog-eared and highlighted and post-its like Kim's post-its um, everywhere. Uh, because I love, I, I, it's a touchstone for me now to think about, um, he talks about how studying the law and needing things to be black and white in the in the courtroom and when you're approaching a case can deeply affect um, how you are in your real life and wrestling with that question of morality and like I said good and bad not being the same as legal and illegal and that some people choose in the end to not even be able to practice because of because of how it's altering the way they look at things right. well anyway it's a real pleasure and I love the little things like when you stand up and Button your jacket. Button your jacket. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. She's not messing around. She needed to let him know. I, I'm curious uh, how much you strive for accuracy when you portray a legal scene. For example, the disciplinary hearing. How much poetic license do you feel you, you can uh, or want to take? And how much do you try to make it look like what a real California disciplinary hearing would look like? In New Mexico. Here. New Mexico, yeah. sorry. Because uh, some of the rules were different, and I tried to look up yeah. all of those. <laughs> you know, 
It's a, it's a great question. Uh, when we started the show, one of the things, actually before, when I knew that this show was even a possibility, I spent a lot of time, well, it's been a few days anyway, not a lot of time, a few days just sitting in on, uh, in court in Los Angeles. Hmm. And, and uh, then eventually we took the whole writer's room down for a couple of days and we would just, we would go through the, uh, uh, the criminal courts building and everyone would split up and say, hey, there's a good one up on four, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd all go through. And we were fascinated by um, uh, the assembly line quality of uh, especially criminal justice, uh, by the, 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 feel, the feeling uh, of, of just the, the procedural stuff that's in between the dramatic moments. Uh, and so we, we've managed to put that in uh, a few episodes, and that's, that's really interesting to us. And we'd like to be, yes, we'd like, to, we'd like lawyers to be, able, we're always asking, are lawyers going to just laugh immediately as soon as they see what we do in the wrong way? So we would like to, we'd like to keep it as real, and also because it's, you know, there's this term tropes, where you know television has done things a certain way for a long time, and so you become used to it, and that's just the way you do a lawyer show. We try to infuse, bring reality uh, as much as we can within within the drama. Uh, the thing that in this particular this particular uh, episode, Gordon Smith, who who wrote it and did a spectacular job, uh, has the advantage of have being uh, the son of a lawyer and also the brother of a lawyer. Uh, and so he was, he was, uh, his, his sister has been, who works at a relatively large law firm, has been very helpful to us talking about uh, Kim's work as an associate. And in this case, um, the disbarment hearing is not something that we've seen in television before. Uh, as Ray said, usually when you see a courtroom scene, it's a big piece of drama put on for the, for the sake of the, uh, for the jury. It's not what I see when I'm on jury duty. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, so Gordon, in our, our office, we, uh, one of our uh, assistants was able to find a complete disbarment hearing for North Carolina really? that is probably, I I'm guessing it's about 12 hours of video. And we all watched some of it, and then Gordon watched the whole thing. And it, it, I think probably the episode that you saw is more dramatic, is way more dramatic than the real thing. Uh, because the truth is that our, our focus has to be on the characters. Uh, and if there's, if there's one, I wish, uh, I hope that in the future we can do, do more with just how kind of, I don't know how to put it, how, how procedural justice really is. And I'm fascinated by also the fact, you see many lawyers in real life who just don't present themselves well or who aren't that aren't geniuses or who aren't on top of things. And I, that, that's sort of interesting for me to see. We haven't seen a lot of that. I, I'm hoping we get to do more of that in the future. If, if, uh, if Jimmy McGill ever gets, uh, I, presumably eventually he'll move into the world of Saul Goodman and we'll get to see more different kinds of lawyers. Because the truth is that most lawyers that I've seen in reality mm -hmm. don't behave, they're not just not, they're just not as on top of things yeah. as the lawyers are in fiction. <laughs> And, and, I that's, like stuff and that's okay. I like that's stuff good. Too when we did the one with uh, Kim's arguing against Schweikert Coakley for the Sandpiper case yes. to not have the admission of their personal records. And it said in the script, she knows she can't win. That's right. And I did talk to a lot that's of lawyers right. about this sort of Sisyphean task element of that's right. just going to bury them in paperwork. No chance of winning this, but it's part of a chipping away and a chipping away. And um, you have to go at it with gusto, but there's a weird fatigue to it too and tediousness to it. I don't know if that answered the question. But I don't we know. We talked a lot. That was good. <laughs> so this will be the third um, consecutive question by a law faculty member here. So it's another <laughs> law question. Um, and I'm interested, um, Ray, in what you said about, uh, what you both said about the relationship between law and morality. And when I think about the three characters on the show, and I'm a big fan, there's kind of like a Goldilocks kind of phenomenon, right? So um, Chuck, on the one hand, has this very magisterial view of the law. Right. Oh, and I was yet, in the porridge. I got it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and yet, probably many of us would say he's kind of the least kind of uh, morally admirable character on the show, right? Kim seems to kind of be right in the middle, right? Doesn't really think too much. You follow the law, you shouldn't break the law. And then Jimmy, of course, has this kind of very um, 
uh, complicated relationship uh, with morality and law and the extent to which you can twist or bend or break the law, right, in furtherance of what he sees as moral ends, but he's then the one who's judging those, and we know that's kind of his tragic flaw. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot deliberately about this relationship between morality and law, and do you kind of think about the characters as representing these kind of three phases? And I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> I don't know if I don't think I'm I I think about it when I think about some of Kim's challenges but I don't ever look at the character as playing symbolic of anything um, or, or think about her uh, in that staggered um, system she's uh, like most humans just barely able to be self-reflective about herself mm -hmm. <laughs> let alone other people I, we do think about m morality in general yeah. I, I don't think we we, I don't think we ever intended, although it's, it's, I love that you see it, that there's three different flavors, mm. three different flavors of lawyer. I, I think one of the things I find interesting about it is that Chuck does talk about the majesty of the law, but the cases that he seems to be involved with, the big, the big case, they, the, the, big, the big client, and the big prize so far on the show is a bank that wants to expand uh, <laughs> across state lines. Uh, and, and so I think one of the things that, I find intriguing about um, the show that I don't, the, or just one of the things we found intriguing was that we pick, we picked areas of the law that you don't see as often, uh, which is sort of, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. It would be probably, this the show would be very different if every week all these characters were defending murder, murder, mur people who are accused of murder or, you know, of, of some, some capital offenses. But the truth is that most most of our characters seem to be doing, having to do things with uh, banking law, uh, and later on you'll see uh, it's another state line, state line case. There's going to be a, uh, there's going to state line case about extraction, extraction over uh, of minerals over state lines. Uh, so it, this, uh, but I think even in those, even in those circumstances, there, there's obviously morality. I think by having the, our focus, having said all that, is not a, really a on cases, it's on the characters. I is I, I like what you say yeah. about the three, the, but I have to I say they're all, they're all I think he's acutely aware of Chuck's. Yeah, yeah. Of, yes. he is part of why yeah. she's looking at her own decisions. Um, his obsession with being right, and that's also in Scott Turow's book, this idea of um, uh, people that debate or practice law can sometimes become fixated on being right. Um, and what is that? And I think she sees Chuck very much that way of to what to what extent how much will you burn down to say that you were right um, and I don't know that she's willing to live that life and I think that's hard for her Peter to your point about uh, the kind of cases you visit you spent almost a let's say a season on Jimmy getting um, elderly people that's right. I mean you don't normally see that <laughs> on, as a trope in lawyer shows that's true and then he then the big case that he gets is uh, they were overcharged for toilet paper. Uh, so yes, so, which is which is really important to him, but it's arguable about how important it is to them. So it's, it's yes, that's a uh, uh, and of course you know that class action suit goes on and is a you know an important element of the show. But you could argue that it's it's yeah uh, you know, this I guess it's a we're a little sometimes we can be a little contrary because the, that's the thing that people always say in show business. Uh, oh, what are the stakes? What are the stakes of the story? Uh, and so that, that's one of the reasons why you get these galactic stakes in so many stories that there's, you know, every story seems to be about people uh, saving the planet or, you know, and that is, sometimes those stories become kind of a little outsized. And so we're, our question is always how much can we invest? How tiny can we make the stakes? How tiny can we make the stakes? Yes, how tiny can we make the stakes? All right, maybe so. Maybe so. Do not pitch that when you go to Sony. No, I will. I will. It's, well, it's Seinfeld was a show about nothing. It's true. We're about something. It's true. Yes. Uh, who's, I think you're next. Yes, um, I start to watch a TV show from Breaking Bad, and I really enjoy it, and then, then follow up Better Call Saul. Kim, I have a question for you. I'm your bigger fan. And oh, thank from you. the TV show, you're always very calm and you speak a very solid and then you never raise voice like today. I mean, the, you know, the, in good way, like a very bubbling, very alive. So how did you adjust that? And I also, I have learned you will study in art, mm -hmm. master degree, and then you also perform um, drama in, when you were in high school. How did you integrate these two? And how did you 
get a chance to start to be an actress. Um, thank, you. thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed the performance. Thank you. Um, and yes, you are correct that I'm quite a bit more of a dork in real life. <laughs> but thank you for calling it bubbly. Um, uh, she, it's, uh, it's fun. It's fun. The more challenging a, car uh, a character, the better. Um, I have always thought uh, it's a, it's a gift whenever a character behaves differently than you do, whether it's in the writing or it's in um, something that you uh, create to go along with the character. And with that first line that we had in the garage scene, um, it was also written, they told me they these two characters have known each other 10 years plus, I'll go as quickly as I can, but they, uh, and, that's, and that's about all we knew. And they, and they have a deep, they are each other's confidants and there is a deep intimacy and, and trust in each other, whether or not that's romantic or not romantic, not even really the point at this part, um, at this juncture. And I loved that. So then you have a scene that is written that he has made this Ned Beatty, you will atone speech <laughs> in the HHM office, um, gets kicked out. He has kicked a trash can on his way in. Um, when he comes back out, the camera shows that the trash can has been kicked before. Um, so we know that he's done this many times. I'm smoking in the garage, and it says he takes the cigarette out of Kim's mouth, inhales, and puts it back in her mouth. So immediately, that's a degree of physical intimacy and closeness. She doesn't say she flinches. Um, and then uh, he says, couldn't you just? She says, you know, I can't. So it implies knowing each other's thoughts very well. It also, an argument that's been had many times. But she doesn't raise her voice. It wasn't that I scream at him. It wasn't that I throw the cigarette down in anger. I simply state my boundaries. He respects them immediately. That says a lot to me. It says a lot to me about her, him, and them. And then she exits, and without looking, it says she picks up the trash can that he has kicked over and fix, writes it and gets in the elevator. So there's some caretaking and some familiarity and, uh, and a slight bit of softness right there at the end. And to me, that's where I started with the character. And I thought she says only what she needs to say and not one word more. She has boundaries that are important to her, and he's one of the only people that she even will speak about it with, negotiate in any way. And, um, and her physical movements are, I, so then I made the physical match the, the, uh, the speaking. This is somebody who doesn't have a lot of fat on anything. It's um, economy, economy of language and movement. And that's where I started from that. And then I would put that into other scenes that we had. Um, and there's even a bit of like a wryness, there's a humor to the way they finish each other's sentences, even when it's that tight and that dry. So then that's where I started to think that maybe they had similar sense of humor. And, uh, and you just grow, you grow from that. And um, for me as an actor, it's just, uh, it's, it's fun. It's fun to be challenged in that way um, to act differently than you normally would in real life. Uh, and the end part, I studied painting and acting, but I didn't do acting until college. Um, I didn't really, I didn't come from an area that, uh, it seemed like you had to be a model, famous, or already know people in the business, and I was none of those categories. But I was fascinated with storytelling, writing stories, mimicking people, imitating people, doing monologues for no one. And, uh, um, and it wasn't until college that I ha there was an acting class, and once I found out there was a, there was a craft behind this, um, then I was obsessed and in love with it. And they've always complemented each other very well, the fine arts and the performing arts, because one is, um, one is a collaborative art form and one I can do on my own when I need to get my brain to unwind. Uh, some, of Ray's, some of Ray's work is actually in Kim's apartment. Yes, so, yes. the bird paintings over her bed are yes. mine. <laughs> I still want to do a time check. We have about five minutes, and I, but, but I want to have the people that are in line finish, if that's okay. Okay. Well, thank you both for coming here, and uh, Better Call Saul is one of my joys of the week, so I look forward to it every Monday evening. <laughs> uh, Peter, you had, you had mentioned that the, that the business of TV has now changed, and perhaps it's the rise of streaming services that bring uh, Twin Peaks back to life after 25 years, <laughs> or there are you know, 10 spin-off shows of uh, Game of Thrones being announced. Um, so what do you see as the future of uh, the Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul universe after the show? Would you be open to more movies, shows coming out uh, in the next 10, 15 years, or would you want to bury it? Uh, that's a, I can't, that's, I, 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 I'm, it's a wonder, wonderful question. By the way, and thank you so much for watching. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time 
in show business or trying to get into show business and not having anyone interest in anything that I did. So the fact, <laughs> the fact that you, you know, we the could have fact been making that, stuff in high school and college, the, apparently. Yeah, the fact that the fact that you know I'm uh, that we're here and, and I'm with Ray and and, and, and here is, it means it means an enormous amount to me. Um, I, I, this is so. This show is so exhausting. I can't. I know. I know when it's over. I'm going to be really miss it. But it's. I can't picture any further. I can't. Picture, <laughs> I can't picture any further than the next few episodes. So uh, that's a. Good, it's a great question. I, the better. The, the Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul universe. I don't know that it's like the Star Wars universe that it's going to go on that it's going to go on going to go on forever and that, that Disney will buy it for billions of dollars. I I would I would like that. That'd be great. Um, that'd, be great. that'd be great. That'd be great. And then you know it's, it's uh, but but I I, we'll I want see, a Lego we'll, set. We'll see. On us. We'll, uh, well that that could happen. Okay, but the, um, isn't there a Kim Wexler action character? I mean, <laughs> there should be. There isn't. There's bobbleheads of everyone else. <laughs> the, the the toy industry. Well, I mean, the, the industry that makes those things is, uh, uh, I don't think it's, I'm telling, it's giving anything out of school, it's, it's, it's a little bit sexist. Uh, so this is, yeah, so this, but, but we need, we need, I agree, we need a Kim Wexler, <laughs> Kim Wexler action figure. Lego would be good. Uh, like, Lego would be probably better. I be love Legos. Probably better. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I'd be open to it, but at some point, at some point, uh, uh, my heart will give out. My hair will fall out. Uh, <laughs> but having said that, I think, I think, uh, I think there are more stories to tell We'll see how far we get with Better Call Saul because Better Call Saul has room in it. Obviously, we it takes place mostly before Breaking Bad, but there's also this um, black and white world Genius. of Nebraska so of Nebraska that takes place after. So we'll see. Who knows? Maybe Better Call Saul will end up being the sequel and the prequel. We'll see. Work for Star Wars. It, it could. It could. <laughs> Yes, maybe you have already explored a little bit. But what is the purpose of the show? Entertainment, or is it the legal stuff? Or can you explore a little bit more on that? And also, the second question, are you ever getting it on the main networks, or are you going to stay on Netflix and Amazon? And why wouldn't the networks take them up? We love, well, I'll answer the second part first, because it's easier. We love working with AMC. Uh, which has been great to us, uh, and, and I don't think that one of the problems with uh, network. There's some great work being done on networks, but uh, you you need an enormous audience for a network show, uh, and to really make it work economically. And you can see from the numbers of shows that get canceled uh, after a few. And we're we're very fortunate that AMC uh, and Sony, who would Sony really owns the show, that uh, Sony's able to. Uh, able to make it work economically, uh, it's, I'm, we're really grateful And for when that. there's a larger audience, you yes. have to adapt yes. your storylines and what you want to do to, because there's more advertisers and more people watching us. So. I get, yeah. yeah. And also, the, a lot of the networks, they have a more commercial breaks, and those are really yeah. hard. Those are really hard to put in. I also, AMC, another thing is, we, this season especially, our episodes sometimes run a little bit short, a little bit long. You can't really do that. You can't really do that on broadcast. So, we're, we, I mean, we're just so lucky to be uh, with AMC, and I, I think uh, they've they've done wonderful. I mean, obviously, you know, our, the, the other show that started uh, a little bit before Breaking Bad was Mad Men, which is you know one of the the great shows I think in history. Uh, so we're very happy for that. What's the purpose of the show? Uh, is, is, a, is a is a big question. Uh, I definitely don't think the purpose of the show is to educate. Uh, future generations of lawyers. Uh, so I think we can rule that we can rule that one out. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, I think it's like any kind of storytelling. I think it has there are multiple uses for it, and um, it's a little bit a little bit what the audience makes of it, if that makes any sense. So actually, on that point, your show is being used to educate future students because um, I, I teach negotiation to law students. And there's two clips that I use. Yeah. Tuco, yeah. Um, scene. Right? Ah. It's such good lawyering. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. Yes. Uh, yes. Figuring out what Tuco's interests are and yes. satisfying them. And then another one is uh, with the Kettleman's, uh, where Betsy's saying, you'll go to jail. And Jimmy says, you know, you'll go to jail too. Right, yes. Um, so I just wanted to give you the feedback. So thank That's you for wonderful. those scenes. And, and those are really helpful in, in teaching students and lawyers too. So we're gonna, you're not turning out a whole new generation of uh, Jim McGill's and Saul Goodman's, are you? 
how to be effective negotiators. Okay, well, there, there you That's go. That's fair. There you go. That was, you know, it's interesting you said because the Tuco scene was a huge, that was a really tough scene uh, to perform. As I, I happened to write that scene. I was, that was one of the great concerns of the actors is Tuco, could he dissuade Tuco by talking to him? Uh, and and uh, fortunately, uh, because you, you, the writing only goes so far, and you know when you have Raymond Cruz, who is an incredibly powerful actor, and Bob and all this, all these wonderful other wonderful actors around, they sometimes you, you I, I remember watching watching the scene the first time and going, uh oh, I hope I hope this works. I hope he he gets away with this. He might die in the second episode <laughs> of the show. All right, our last. Uh... Last question. All right. Um, I first want to say that I'm a huge fan of the show as well. Like, I think in I would go as far as to say in like modern television, it's like some of the mo best like storytelling and some of the most like nuanced like character development. And I think wow. I, one of the things I really like about the show is like the pacing throughout like most episodes. Like, you usually like you know there's like a cra crazy climax to it, but there's like this fo like deliberate like focus on like artistry and like pacing throughout the show, which I think was like not so much there in Breaking Bad if like in terms of like there's a bit of like more of a focus on like you know the little details and characters doing th like you know like interactions with each other and so I was just wondering like you know like when you did Breaking Bad like were like were there some like de deliberate lessons you learned in terms of like okay when we do Better Call Saul we want to take it in a slightly like different direction and maybe focus on like different aspects of the storytelling um so yeah that's sort of like basically my question I, it's, it's it's a great question it's at, you, I, one of our I'll speak for myself. One of my great concerns starting Better Call Saul was that we'd be in competition with Breaking Bad because I think we were all so proud of Breaking Bad, especially that uh, really it was Vince. Vince decided to end the show when he did, and he and he really managed to, uh, hopefully with our help, to stick the landing. And so because that was the goal. That was a, I remember talking to Brian Cranston pretty early on, and we fantasized that someday there'd be a story that you could just follow through and it'd be one story of this, of, of this, this man and his family um, and Jesse and it would begin, have a beginning, a middle and end. There'd be a row of DVDs and that actually happened. And that was, so it was a little bit tempting fate to start Better Call Saul. Uh, and I think we tried to think, to try to, try to conceptualize it a little bit differently. I think the thing that they have in common um, is that they both grow out of the DNA of the who the main character is. Uh, so Breaking Bad, if you watch Breaking Bad, especially the beginning of it, it's all organized. All the other characters, it seems to me, um, were invented to illuminate Walter White and who Walter White was. And to some extent that's true with uh, Better Call Saul, but we also have uh, a little bit of a, a split because we have this other character, Mike Ehrmantraut, who is also very important to the show and obviously was on Breaking Bad. So it has a slightly different, that has a different tone, but Mike brings with him a different tone. You know, he brings a, 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 a way Jonathan Banks plays him, a, a great deliberation, not that many words. Um, and I, I think if there's anything we, I don't know if we learned from Breaking Bad, but I think that it gave us the fact that we were, uh, that that had worked and that we were going to start to get, there was no percentage in playing it safe. We had to do what we think we thought was right, and we've we've been so lucky that the audience has been willing to follow us down because you know, the the I, Sometimes I have people say, "Oh, it's so slow," uh, and you know, if you want fast, there's lots of fast. Stuff. I don't think it's slow myself, uh, but uh, you know, you have to be interested in the characters. Uh, you have to be in order to keep watching it, and that's that's where we are. We're interested in the characters. I don't know if that, that's a, that's a long-winded kind of labyrinth. I, I, I need to go to law school to, to, perfect, <laughs> to, perfect, to perfect my statements and I'll have all this topic sentence and then I'll back it up and, and, uh -huh. and, cite, and cite some references. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that, anyway, that's, I, I really, but I really, I think we all appreciate, uh, appreciate especially all the smart people here enjoying the show. Uh, and that means a lot. Let's thank our guests.